So we're, we're recording. So let me just put a little summary on there. We were talking about about your family, and uh, their their cultural leaning um, about you needing to achieve. You were very successful, popular singer in the Indian culture. You're now in the United States. And so you're not an Indian anymore. You're not popular anymore. You're not there. And you're trying to get popular here. Not really working, but a lot of competition here and so on. So what you would really like to do, and make sure I'm saying this right, Shraddha, okay? What you would really like to do is just to be able to just freely sing whatever you want to sing. Whether or not it's popular, whether or not your family judges you for um, not being popular and for maybe carrying more weight than they think is appropriate. <laughs> you would like insulation from freedom from that. Did I say it right? Yes. And then I asked you, I asked you, I asked you the question. I said, well, what would it take as far as you can tell for you to have this kind of freedom from this judgment? that I just discussed. And you were going to answer and then we decided to record, so. What did it take? Uh, I guess a deep knowing that I am good enough as it is. As I I'm making a note here. Yeah. Let me do, I'm, I'm going to do a little testing with you before we, see, eventually, eventually what I'd like to do with you today is um, an unseen therapist session that would be aimed at this very issue. Okay. Uh, it would be a good start session with one that starts you on the way, uh, and then other skills you learn within the course and so on um, would uh, augment that and help you out more, et cetera. Um, but along the way, and, and I'm sort of teaching Shraddha as we do this, I like to put as much on the table for unseen therapists, much as plain sight for unseen therapists to work with by the time we get there, okay? Because this is important to recognize. The unseen therapist... Um, is not going to interfere with your free will to believe whatever you want to believe, okay? That would be an unloving thing to do. That would be saying, Shraddha, you can have this belief, but you can't have that one, okay? That's, that's interfering with your free will to believe whatever you want. It's the, the thought belief. So if something is under the table because you don't want to look at it or because it, you've repressed it or you've forgotten it or whatever, um, we want to take as much from under the table and put it on top of the table as we can before we bring in unseen therapists. All right. So I want to ask you some questions and these are sort of, they're like tests. I just find out where things are. So I'm going to give you some sentences to say. All right. And please, if you would, please say them out loud and then pause and think, assess on a scale of zero to 10, how true do they feel to you? Now, that's an important instruction. We don't want the logic of it. Logic is one thing, okay? How true does it feel to you? It, it may be irrational, possibly, but we want to know the emotional response. So here's the first one. I'm not good enough. Say that out loud, please, and then give me a zero to ten. I'm not good enough. Eight. All right. And um, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. Eight again. All right. 
I don't count. I don't count. Six. All right. Last one I have here is I'm not lovable. I'm not lovable. Six. All right. Now, logically, I'm going to shift from your emotional response to logically. Logically, are you good enough? Yes, I am. Well, okay. From what you're telling me, logically, you are an excellent singer. You were very popular in India. Yes? You have some issues with your voice that we can probably address. Okay. But good enough? Not just good enough. Maybe even superb. Would I be right? Yeah. Okay. But the emotional response is different. Okay. What we want to be able to do is to take the emotional response and match it up with the, <laughs> the logical response. Okay. So you don't have that baggage weighing on you. All right. Now, is there something wrong with you? Logically. No. Well, you just told me a minute ago you were too, according to your family anyway, you were too fat. Yeah. I did. Well. But there's nothing wrong with me physically. Okay. I'm All right. Uh, logically, do you count? Yeah, I do. And logically, are you lovable? I am. Ready? Now, why do you why do you say? Tell me why you say you're lovable. After all, you're too fat. <laughs> I'm, because I'm I'm testing you. Okay, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, because I'm funny. I have a way of talking to people that they like, and um, generally, I'm a nice person. Uh -huh. All right. You have a lot of friends? Yeah, I do. Uh, you're married? Yes. Uh, that's working well? Yeah, that's working very well. Okay. Thankfully, they let me choose. <laughs> Say it again. Oh. <laughs> Thankfully, they let me choose. <laughs> yeah, because that's, yeah, that's a good idea. I've given you a story about yes. <laughs> somebody else where they couldn't choose. Their culture yeah. wouldn't let them even choose mm -hmm. their own husband. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the voice. How is it different now than it used to be? Uh, it's it's cracking at the high registers to physically speak about it. When I speak when I sing on the higher notes, um, I'm not able to sustain it for a long time. And usually, you're, wait, wait, you're not able to what sustain it for oh, a sustain. long time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, and sooner or later, your, your voice cracks. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it didn't do that previously. Uh, yes, it did. I've always had an issue with my voice. Um, even though, even through the times that I was a good, I was popular in India. I've always had that uh, feeling or notion that I wasn't popular enough. But yes, I've always had that physical issue with my voice. Oh, okay. Is it just worse now than it was? or? Yeah, it is. As best as you can. Just tell me how much. Is it twice as bad? 10% worse? Uh, give me some kind of a numerical thing if you can. Yeah. It, I could say it's twice as bad. Yes. Oh, twice as bad. Well, give me a sense of that now. So if you're going to. Does that mean you can't hit this high note or does that mean you can't sustain it as long? So uh, my the concerts that I sing run for one hour, one and a half hours, which I could easily perform till my voice felt tired or sounded tired over the microphone. But this uh, at this point in my life, I'm not able to sustain my voice, not feeling or he, uh, you know, audibly tired for more than half hour. So at the end of a half hour mark, my voice is already sounding tired. It's feeble in places. It's I'm not able to use my breath 
and my vocal ability properly, uh, all these issues start arising in the half hour mark, whereas I used to be able to do it. I mean, it used to happen at the end of the concert or after the concert. After an hour and a half concert, maybe it would happen previously. Maybe yes. Okay. But now it will happen after a half an hour? Yeah. Okay. And so when it happens, is it an embarrassing thing or or is yes. it a little thing that only you notice or no, it's uh uh it's an embarrassing thing for obviously me. Um and um my mother who can also notice the fact that I have had an issue at that half hour mark or from there on. Um, she's my teacher. My mom is my teacher, by the way. So it's mostly just me and mom dissecting it. But yes, recently others have started telling me that, yeah, we heard your voice going awry, but it's okay. You still were sounding beautiful and all that. So yeah, it is an embarrassment. Well, if they're saying you still sounded, they noticed it, but you still sounded beautiful. Did you believe them? No. <laughs> they were just being nice to you? Yeah. Well, I wasn't there, but could it be possible that they really meant it? And they just looked right, maybe noticed it, but just looked right beyond it? Yeah, it it's very possible. Um. Well, as you know from our previous discussion, I happen to be an Elvis fan, but I want to draw a little parallel if I can. Elvis ended up with a bunch of drugs and everything else, and at the end of his career, um, he was on stage. He'd forget the words. Um, his voice would crack. He would be off tune. Um, but the fans, they may have heard it, but they did not care yeah <laughs> they were so in love with elvis that it just it just didn't matter he was way overweight like a hundred pounds overweight i mean way overweight okay mm -hmm. um there's more to singing there's more to singing and performing than the perfect voice yeah that's my view anyway do you see that yes there's more to being popular as a singer than the perfect voice. Uh, in a, I, I just want to, this is just philosophy. I just want to get your take on these things, okay? Yeah. There's an American singer, still sings some, I think. Willie Nelson, you know the name? Yes. Okay. I'd mm -hmm. love to listen to Willie Nelson, but does he have a voice anywhere near Barbara Streisand? Not really. Not even close. Not even close, yeah. Not even close, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he just keeps singing the songs. He just keeps selling the records. And, and he's he's not even, a, he's a lovable guy, but he, he, his personal life, <laughs> he, he evades income taxes and all, does all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reason I'm mentioning that is, Is it possible, as far as you can understand, that you could even sing, let your voice crack, be off key once in a while or whatever, make technical mistakes singing, and still absolutely love the audience and they love you anyway? Uh, yeah, well, it hasn't, it has happened that I've had a good concert anyway. I've, I've, I've had people come and say that it was a great concert, but because of those mistakes and the, the one person who sits in front, which is my mom, uh, giving me the feedback of what happened and how I could improve. Um, I never, I never really believed those comments, those positive comments. Okay. All right. Now I'm developing a perception. And, and one of the things you need to do, Shraddha, is recognize that all I know about you is what you've told me in this short conversation. I don't know the rest. So I have to guess a lot. 
Now, the reason to guess is because I've been around here this a while, okay? That mm -hmm. doesn't make them accurate. Yeah. So I'm going to give you some perceptions. I'm going to give you one in a moment here that seems to fall in place from my point of view. But you need to correct me because if you don't, then we're walking in doors that aren't going to be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if I'm inaccurate or I miss it or you need to adjust what I'm thinking, please, please, you need to do that. Okay. So here's what I'm thinking. And I don't, I, I'm trying to put some pieces together that you haven't even said yet. But between your culture and with, with, and maybe especially your mother, there's a lot of judgment that comes your way. Okay, now I'm going to go back in time. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably right on this, although we never discussed it just because it's what humans do. But as a young child, just like every young child, you are looking for love. Everyone does that, even adults, young children especially. Mm -hmm. And the major sources of love, parents. And when your mother is your teacher and a major source of love, one of the things very young Shraddha do from a very early age is begin to say, I better please my mother or I'm not good enough, something is wrong with me, I'm not lovable, I must please my mother or else. How am I doing? Ready on point. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> would I would I be accurate in saying that the um, opinion of your mother and your voice cracking and all of that, um, you may be taking on. No, I'm not, I'm not going to suggest that you shouldn't take it seriously. Like you want to make your voice as good as you can. Yes, 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 yes. But you may be overdoing it. And in fact, you may be have your voice cracking because you're because of the judgment that's going to be coming your way. Tell me. Sounds twisted, but maybe because I it feels like a form of self sabotage, and I. Wait, wait, wait a, a for, oh, self sabotage. Yeah. So. Okay. Which. Which feels, uh, yeah, which feels true because I, I may be doing this to myself so that, I don't know, I can, maybe get some sort of uh, excuse from my mother for judging me too harshly. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> well, okay. That wasn't exactly what I was thinking, but that's a really good point because, you know, that's the kind of thing we do. It may not be logical, but it's the kind of thing we do. And it's because we have unresolved emotional stuff clear back from childhood. Now, when did your mother begin being your vocal teacher? What age? Um, I, at what age I, I want to, she's always been in the background. Um, I started my vocal journey when I was five years old and, um, she, uh, I had different teachers, but she, I would say that she seriously became my teacher when, um, I left my first teacher's so which was about 11, 11 years okay. old. The, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but I'm hearing, and again, correct me, <clears throat> that maybe she wasn't a um, a direct vocal coach up until 11, but even earlier on, she was one who was constantly guiding you yeah. with, ju with, ju yes. with, ju with judgment. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you do it. This is how you, this is how you be a polite little girl. This is how you go to school. This is how you, yeah, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So always, always mother has your guidelines. I'm not criticizing your mother. No, of course. Yeah. We're just trying to see 
what thing. So she is giving you all these guidelines all this time of how it is you should conduct yourself in the world. Yeah. Okay. But she didn't shoot your husband for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. One of the things that could be happening here, um, and it's a perception of mine, so again, correct it. Mm -hmm. Here is mother, who I am presuming, but you didn't say this, this is my perception. Okay. Has a lot of unrest within herself. Uh, a lot of judgment that has come upon her. Mm -hmm. Um a family background that maybe was not as loving as it could be. And she is using you as a badge for her. The better you are, the politer you are, the better student you are, the better singer you are, the better she looks. Does that work? Wow. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. All right. So what we're trying to do there. Again, is not to criticize your mother. We're trying to understand, and this is one of the more advanced parts of our course. It's called reframing. Mm -hmm. yes. And what we're trying to do here before we ever bring an unseen therapist in is we're trying to look at all this and what's really affecting you. And here we have a mother who appears to be, my term, overbearing, overguiding, all right, who is doing so for her own reasons, it's, that they are perfectly valid to her. Mm -hmm. But your perception would be, and again, correct me, from a very young, young girl, I better do what mother says or she won't love me. Does that work? Well, it has never been uh, as, I mean, I have been in the presence of her family as well, uh, obviously. And they are much more overbearing than she has been on me. I mean, she has allowed me certain freedoms, I would say. Um, and she's always <laughs> reminded me of that as well, that she had it much tougher than I do. So she uses that as a, as a measuring stick of how much love and attention she's given me uh, in comparison to how much she has gotten from her own parents, her okay. own mother specifically. All right. Uh, uh, to me, Shraddha, that's a very classic response of someone who grew up with little or no loving input. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't know how to handle it. And believes she needs to shape you up correctly, similar to the way she was shaped up, but not so much. <laughs> that way she can feel better about herself and you are still a bad. See, if you turn out terrible, if you, you know, stole things and went to prison and did all kinds of bad things or whatever it was, uh, ooh, ooh, that would destroy, destroy. That would certainly impact her, if not destroy her. Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Recently, I had a conversation with her where I told her that I needed space from um, constantly thinking about Carnatic music and constantly having to worry about why I'm not performing. And I said, I just need a break. I need to figure out where I stand with my voice and I need to just take some time off. I don't want to practice anymore. Um, and um, yeah, she had a tough time taking it. Okay. So, yeah, that right. was in in her eyes. Uh, she failed. All right. Well, the way I'm seeing this so far is that the now, I really don't know this because I'm not a vocal coach and all of that. I'm not a doctor either. But a major contributor, it seems to me, for the voice cracking and all of that is that you're not free to sing however you want to sing. Yeah, the, the structure of that music itself is like that. 
Okay. Yeah. But if you wanted to sing a a an American love song, a ballad that doesn't require you to go up and down and all over the place, your voice would be fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. One of the things, yeah, yeah, obviously, you know, I've attended concerts and in America and I've heard people sing and one thing and another. Mm -hmm. But the thing that, that comes out of that concert, this is to me sitting in the audience now. This is not me, your mother, that needs to have your voice be just perfect and all that. Mm -hmm. Is I need to know that that singer with that song believes it. Whatever that message is in that song, that singer believes it. Uh, this was probably way before your time. Do you ever remember Peter, Paul, and Mary? No. Okay, well, it was a trio, two men and a woman, a couple of guitars. Woman had a nice voice, okay. probably not as nice as yours. <laughs> and they sing a bunch of songs, but one of them was If I Had a Hammer. You ever heard that song? If I had a hammer, I would hammer in the morning. You ever heard that? No. Well, it's a song of freedom. It's a, it's a freedom song. And when those three people got in there and started singing that, it just moved that whole audience. And it is not a demanding song. That you would find demanding at all. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, it's it it, it it doesn't go out of one octave, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'm telling you this because I want to get get a sense of this. Um, your cracking voice. You may never have been asked these questions before, so just do your best with it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> your cracking voice. If you were singing a song that you really believed and you really believed the message in it and Mother wasn't even in the audience, could you pull that song off? Yeah. Even in high registers and all that. Yeah. Mother's not there. Mother's will mother will never hear that song. She will never hear it. She's we were gonna put her on a boat and send her send her to someplace else. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I believe I would have total freedom to sing it however I want to sing it. Yeah. And and what do you think would happen to the after a half an hour, the high registers. I don't believe it would. I don't believe it would matter, even if it did break. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I love to say. Yeah, that's important. So I, I think I think we're we're narrowing this down to something I said earlier. The real issue here is your emotional response to your mother's judgments. Did I say it? Well, tell me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what we want to work on is your response to your mother's judgments. Mm -hmm. After all that. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> all right. Well, it, it helps to do all this. And, and, yeah. and again, we're reframing now. Yes. One of the things we did, we reframed earlier, we talked about your mother and her own background, her need for you to be a badge, and it's her own unrest, her own lack of self-confidence of her own. You better do it right. If you're going to do it wrong, she's she could be have to have some problems about that. Okay. The underlying message in that reframe is that the issue, the real issue, isn't yours. It's your mother's. Now, okay. you do have an issue in it, and that is your response to it. Your response to some tightness shows up in your voice. Better do, better do it right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think you can have some freedom from that, okay? 
That's all I ever wanted. <laughs> well, but we, uh, it's not the kind of thing I, well, I could be wrong here too. It could be a one minute wonder. Okay. But there's probably more to it. It gets unraveled, et cetera. But we want to do an unseen therapist session now. And we want to uh, aim at that issue. Mm -hmm. Now, I've really got to go back here a ways to see what you've done so far in, is in this course. So you've read my book, The Unseen Therapist. Yes. Yeah. Okay. At the end of that book is a segment called The Personal Peace Procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And that urges you to make a list of at least 30 specific events. Have you yeah. done that? Yeah. Oh, do you have it handy? Uh, I believe I do. Yeah. All right. If you would, if you would, um, Look down that list and pick out one with your mother. I assume you have some there with your mother. Yes. <laughs> All right. Pick, pick one out that you think is a big one. And just tell me, just read what you wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, mother constantly berating me for not wanting to practice um all of my young age into adulthood uh, say that say that last part again all what all through young age into adulthood okay all right now we, we need to get to base we need to get to basics here because this is really 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 important um mm -hmm. that that particular segment you may want to go back and read it again because i want to Take what you wrote down, and I want to be more efficient with it. Now, okay. as you recall, by the way, I got to have to ask you something. Sure. Do you feel me now about ready to judge you? Sorry. Do you feel right now that I'm about ready to judge you like your mother? No. Oh, you don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, because I, in a way, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with what you did. Okay. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's what's wrong with what you did is too strong a word, but we want to make things more efficient and so on. Yeah. In that segment, the personal peace procedure, there is a sentence that I put forward mm -hmm. for forming a specific event properly. Do you recall the sentence? Yes. The time when something happened and I feel so so about it. Okay. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. First of all, I've revised that book a handful of times. Okay. And the latest revision is maybe three, maybe four months ago. Oh. Are you reading the latest revision or maybe something prior to that? I believe I'm re reading the latest one because I just I just read it. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. But let's go over the sentence. The sentence wasn't quite. Oh, maybe quite I'm way... framing it. I'm, I'm not exactly. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well. Those were the words I used in a previous version. That's why I. Oh, so. okay. Anyway, anyway, the, the the new the now revised words are the moment, not the time when, the moment, the moment when, yes. okay, and then whatever happened, and I currently feel whatever the emotion is about it. Not I felt. Mm -hmm. That's what I feel now. See feel what what you felt back then. We can't change. That's it's, it's, that's long. It's, that's how you felt then. But what you feel about it now, we can change, and elegantly. That's the important part. So, the moment when then we said what happened, and I I didn't write it all down. But you said your mother was constantly berating you about your practice and did not, and this happened over a long period of time, et cetera. See, that's not a specific event. That's a whole long series of stuff that happened in your life. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for is a specific, that's why it said the moment when. Okay? Yes. yes. A specific moment where you get a crescendo thing like, oh, I did it wrong. Oh, what's wrong with me? Kind of thing. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I feel guilty about this. I feel angry about this. Humiliated or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to look. We want to look for a specific moment within all those years. What you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So pick out a moment. Uh, wherever you are, you're you're in the kitchen. You're you're in the car. Your your mother is saying something to you. And the farther back you can go, even if it's not in singing, the better. The more foundational it's going to be. So yes. pick something as far back as you can where your mother is berating you. Got it. And tell me about that. Okay. Um, I believe I was 11, 12 at this point, early teens. Um, my mother was taking me to one of my music classes. And um, as she was riding on the bike, um, she usually used to take me on her bike. She was just um, scolding me for not practicing enough. Why, why don't you want to practice enough? Why are you not motivated? If you did it, you would be so much better. You would, you would do so much better. You just, you need to practice your voice every day for one hour. You're not feeling it. You're not getting it. And I, at that moment, I, I did, I remember I started crying. And um, even today, I feel very, I, I feel sad about it, that moment. Well, now, is sad the right word? Um, would other words like feeling guilty, not yeah. goody? Yeah, guilty of, for not feeling the motivation to practice. What's wrong with me? Why, why do I not feel the need to practice or feel motivated enough to practice? Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, Okay. And what I'm hearing in that is your mother is saying, you need to be much better than you're doing if you do just Otherwise, I'm not going to look good. I need to really look good. And so you need to practice. Now, that yeah. may not be what she's consciously thinking, but I've, it's in there. Would that be correct? Yeah. Okay. And you're going along. Well, in some fashion, she is imposing on you what you need to do to make her feel better. It's all, it's all in the guise of that way you'll be a better singer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, age 11 or 12 is childhood. Better still, if you can find one further back, whether or not it had to do with singing. If you can find one at age three, that's better. That's more foundational. It's more likely to be foundational. It's still your mother berating you, okay? It's yeah. still going to be the same kind of issue. The details may be a little different. Yeah. Can you think of something? Uh, I don't remember the details so much, but um, I do believe that she, uh, when I started my music classes, she thought um, that my voice was very feeble and weak and um, uh, through her stories I remember this I'm blessed with a very bad memory of my childhood so uh, through what she told me she she keeps telling me that you know I I forced you to practice every single day and therefore your voice became much stronger much louder um, much heavier than what it was which was what was needed for the type of music you sang. So this was at, as far as I can remember, I feel six, seven, six, maybe. Yes. All right. But give me a specific event. Where so are you? Was, where are you when this happens? In my house, in my practice room, in the room, music room where we practice. And um, I'm doing my daily routine uh, singing long notes, sustaining notes, and she's giving me feedback on how I should open my mouth. I should, I should try uh, to sing louder and pushing me that way. All right, but as you told me, as you told it to me earlier, a little earlier, she was. 
I mean, it's one thing, but you were just telling me now is she's coaching you about things to do mechanically yeah. with your voice. Yeah. But she eventually she says something to you, and I forgot what that was. It, eventually, she uh, she says probably when I can remember more. I remember her saying that because of me working with you through your young age, I molded your voice to become stronger through that practice, through the daily practice that I put you through. Okay, all right. And she may well be right, but if at age six, by the way, um, as far as I know, every six-year-old or just about every six-year-old has a feeble voice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, have you ever seen America's Got Talent? Yeah. Currently, there's a, a young opera singer there, age nine. Have you seen mm -hmm. her? No, no, I have not current, no, not current with it. Extraordinary, just extraordinary, age nine, okay. Mm -hmm. But also rare, 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 rare to find that kind of vocal range and control and everything else with somebody nine years old, okay much less six. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I had it at nine years old. Oh, okay. So you were, you were one of those rare ones. Yeah. And it may well be your mother's coaching helped get you there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hooray for mom for that. Yes. <laughs> good, good. Um, but let's go back. Let's go back to this. What we're looking for in this specific event and your mom is telling you, she's actually saying to you, you are as good as you are because I'm your great coach. That's essentially what she's saying. Yes? Yeah. Okay. I'm not hearing in there anything where you are having a negative emotional response. You're not feeling guilty. You're not feeling angry. You're not feeling sad. Is there something about that? Where those emotions do arise? About the fact that she molded my voice? Well, that whole specific event, anything in that specific event that would have a negative emotion in it for you? Mm, I don't have, because I don't remember it as such. Okay. All right. So what we're looking for is, see, we're always looking to, to adjust to improve your emotional response to things. Okay. That's why we want to go to these specific events because they tend to be containers for these emotional responses and we can shift those. All right. Mm -hmm. So can you think of another one where your mother was berating you or criticizing you or something as far back as you can remember? And you were going, oh, what's wrong with me? Or, you know, I. I feel guilty or bad or something. With regards to music, that's the earliest one I can remember. The one I told you on the motorbike. And that was the one at age 11? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we, we will work with that one then. Okay. Um, uh, but as a, what is, what may happen? may happen okay is as we do this and then we start testing how well we did it it may be that other specific events will come up we may get an improvement on that one but something more foundational will show up okay different we call them aspects and related yes. events and things like that yeah okay so remind me again, uh, you're a age 11. Um, you're on the back of your mother's bike? Yes. Okay. And she's saying to you, you need to practice more, you need to practice more, you need to practice more. Mm -hmm. You're not practicing enough. Yeah. Is that is that the proper, is that the crescendo phrase you're not practicing enough and then you're feeling guilty about it uh yes yes 
you're not practicing enough, you're not motivated enough to practice, to practice more. And your emotional response says, ah, is, so, I feel I mean, so guilty. Why am I not motivated? What should I do to motivate myself? All that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, you're 11 years old and you'd like to play with your friends. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I would think that me having, well, when I was five and six, I would always look to my mother's um, uh, idea of what I should be doing for a day. But then when you get older, 10 and 11, you have your own ideas of what you would like to do in a day. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. All right. Now, we need one more piece of this before we go any further with it. Close your eyes now. Rerun that movie now, even though it's not perfect, but just rerun it as best you can. All right. And tell me currently, now as you remember it, on a, what zero to 10 intensity you get about it. Seven. Seven. Uh, is it a guilty response still? It's not guilty, it's just sad, sadness. All right. Okay, hold on one second here. Um, here open your eyes. Open your eyes. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's bring an unseen therapist. Let's do a little session here. Okay. Okay. Now, what's going to happen here is going to be a little more advanced than we usually do for a newcomer. But I wanna do this with you just so you get a sense of the higher end of things. There'll be a little reframing here. We're gonna do some, probably do some stuff with your mother mm -hmm. and your response to your mother in general. Okay. The specific event itself. So I'm probably gonna wander around a little bit, okay. but it's, it's gonna be easy for you because all you have to do is just follow along. <laughs> you have to do anything but just follow along okay however i will say at any time that you think well where you're going doesn't fit or something is now coming up i want to i want to put in here feel mm -hmm. free okay feel free okay all right if you would if you would just close your eyes right? and take a nice deep relaxing breath And now shift your focus, and not shift your focus, different term. Recall some loving moment, some simple little loving moment in your life, and just nod your head whenever you're, whenever you're there. All right. And Shraddha, I'm going to digress. Keep your eyes closed. I'm going to digress just for a moment because there's a little, there's something some newcomers get confused about regarding this recalling a loving moment. So I just want to spend a little moment on it so we can talk about that. Some newcomers think, well, we're going to be accessing the spiritual dimension, the unseen therapist. God, um, I better do this right or I'm going to fail. Okay. I, I better bring in angels and harps and you know, orchestras and horns and you know, all of that, a Hollywood moment, or it's not going to work. That's how some seem to think this has to be. Not true at all. This ultimate love is something the unseen therapist says, you and I don't have it at this point, not running around in the human form. So all we're doing with recalling a loving moment, which could be simply, you know, your dog looking you in the face, something like that. Some nice little gentle little moment okay is we're just aligning ourselves as best we can with the ultimate pure healing love of the unseen therapist mm -hmm. that's all we're doing we're really saying to her look we know you're always guiding us we're not always listening but right now we're going to be listening we're lining up the best we can we're lining we're going to give you something to work on Let's see what happens. That, that's all that is, just so you know. 
just so you know, very simple little process. So now, let's give her something to work on. So shift your focus now to there you are on the bicycle, back of the bicycle. Your mother's, you know, doing the bicycling. And she's telling you over and over and over again, berating you about your practice. You must practice. You must practice. You must practice. You must practice. You aren't practicing enough. You aren't motivated enough. And there you are feeling very sad about this. How am I going to motivate myself? I'm going to have to please my mother. She needs to be pleased. If she's not pleased with me, I'm going to interpret that she doesn't love me or I'm not lovable or something's wrong with me. I'm guilty, this kind of thing. I'm very, as I think about that, I'm very sad about that. So unseen therapist understands this. She sees it with mature eyes that you couldn't possibly have at age 11. He says, well, let's spend a little time, Shraddha, with your mother. Let's, we're not going to excuse her behavior. Yeah, she's berating a child. She's doing the best she thinks she needs to do. But it confuses you, makes you sad and guilty at the moment and, and all of this. Okay. And she's not really understanding what she's doing. So Unseen Therapist says, let's spend a few moments now looking at your mother. Let's put her in front of you. There she is. By the way, is she still living? Yes. Okay. There she is in front of you. Notice her posture, maybe a little tight. Notice her face, maybe a little tight, not so soft. Her eyes, when she's in what when she's in one of those moods anyway. And let's recall her own background. She came from a place of even more criticism, at least to hear her talk about it, than you have. Lots of criticism. Here's young your mother, not getting any, uh, presumably any sembl semblance of love whatsoever. This is how she grew up. This is how she thinks things need to be. She's not really experiencing love, although she has a big need for it, like everyone does. So imagine, in your own imagination, there's your mother. But within her, you can like, like see within her torso a love sponge. A dry love sponge. It's like a water sponge, which fills up with water and then overflows and all of that. But this, this soaks up love, and it's pretty dry. Let me pause here for a moment with your eyes to oppose. Let me ask you, would I be correct in assuming that one of your mother's greatest needs would be love? Yes. Okay. So without all that love, here comes all that criticism. I mean, that could certainly be a motivator here. So here, just, just imagine her with that empty love sponge. And now that's you and I, says the Unseen Therapist. Let's get together. I have ultimate love here. You're getting some of it now. Let's together share our love under, in a way of understanding your mother. We're not, gonna, we're not criticizing her behaviors or excusing them. We're going to take a step towards understanding them. And that's a step towards forgiveness. It's a step towards freedom. When we really understand where your mother is coming from, We can be lighter about her criticism because we understand where it's not about you. 
she's really reflecting what's missing within her. So there's your love sponge. And the unseen therapist and you are standing together. And you're looking beyond all of her criticisms at the little child that needs love within her that needs love so bad, that love sponge. And you watch it fill up. Just spend a moment and watch it fill up. And as you do in your imagination, watch your posture shift, soften a bit. Watch your eyes soften. The expression on her face, her gestures, her need to criticize, softens. She needs love. And maybe for the first time in her life, she's getting it. Watch it soften. In, in there someplace is something other than the critical mother that must be done, things must be done her way so that she feels better about herself and you're her badge to Ah, and maybe you could even say to yourself, I love you, mom. I love you. And in your imagination, maybe you can, as she gets softer, do your best with this. Have her say to you, ah, Shraddha, I love you. I love your voice. I'm so glad I could have a part in making it as beautiful and as strong as it is. But what you do with it is up to you now. Yeah, I may criticize. Yes, I may do all this berating and stuff, but yeah, look beyond me, okay? I'm just, that's just my own stuff. I love you. And I love to hear you sing. And I would love to hear you sing without me being in the front row someday. <laughs> I would love to hear you sing without my critical ears and my critical mind and my critical judgments. I would love to know the love that comes from you. And now Unseen Therapist is sitting next to you and saying, you know, one of the things we might want to do, Shraddha, in your mother's behalf and in your behalf, is imagine yourself singing one of your favorite songs, a song you really believe in, a song maybe that has those high registers and you sing it and it doesn't matter whether you crack or not. You just sing it because you love singing. It's a love song to your mother. Spend a few moments, Shraddha, doing that. And whenever you're done, just say something. Keep your eyes closed, say something and we'll go on. Okay. All right, good. Good. All right, now, let's uh, put our focus back. There you are on the bicycle with your mother. And she's saying to you, you're not practicing enough. You're not motivated enough. And you're sitting there, as you remember that, you're thinking, sitting there being very sad about that. What a what a predicament to put you, put you in a very young child who doesn't know how to motivate herself. How does anybody do that? You're either motivated or you aren't in many cases. And we're going to take your sadness response, the seven that you talked about, and we're going to represent it to unseen therapists metaphorically as a unwanted vibration around your heart, ta-ta, 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 like that. We're not asking you to actually make your heart vibrate. It's an imaginary thing. It's a way to metaphorically show unseen therapists 
portrayed, portrayed his sadness feeling to unseen therapists. So in your imagination, she sees it. She understands you don't need to keep carrying that around. She understands you need to be free of that and other, other events like that. And so she sends a gentle, cooling, healing breeze towards you, enters your body, surrounds that unwanted vibration around your heart with understanding and love. And with that level of love that Unseen Therapist is bringing in, that sadness can't survive. It starts to shift towards understanding. Well, that's the way mother is. Okay. I'm free. It starts shifting towards from sadness to freedom. And so here comes that cooling breeze as it addresses the unwanted vibration on your heart, the ta-ta, 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 ta-ta goes ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. And we'll do that again. Here's this sadness, which we're shifting to understanding and freedom, which is this unwanted vibration around your heart represented that way. Ta-ta, 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 cooling breeze, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. So if you would, Shraddha, now take your time. Repeat that. The uh, unwanted vibration around your heart, the sadness. Ta-ta, 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 cooling breeze, ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta. As sadness shifts to understanding and freedom. Take your time. Do it once, twice, more if you want. And whenever you're done, just open your eyes. There are no grades here, by the way. You're not being judged whatever happens happens and we'll discuss it Okay. All right. Were you able to follow along okay? Did you have a bunch of competing thoughts? What, what, what happened? No competing thoughts. I was able to follow along perfectly. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so then what did happen? Uh, in the, where? Um, uh, in what the, was the experience like? As... as as you said, I saw a small child. I saw you, her. You saw, I saw what? I saw my mom uh -huh. as a small child. Ah, okay. That came. I, and I saw that she needed love too. And this was the film of her life playing in her head when she said all those words to me. And... Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, um, I'm a great one for testing. <laughs> so we want to test. We want to, we'll start with the test and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. So if you would close your eyes, run this movie again. There you are on the bicycle. Your mother's saying what she's saying. You're responding with the sadness and so on. Tell me if you're still a seven or some other number, up, down, or whatever. I'm not a seven. Uh, it's a zero. A zero. Yeah, I'm just looking at it as if it's it's a it's a movie. Like it's a movie, and you're sitting in the in, in theater, another. looking at the screen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. All right. Well, do this for me. Let's. Uh, this is another level of testing with your eyes still closed. Run the movie, but this time, get out of the theater seat. Get in the movie. Get on that bicycle. Yeah. Hear those words, and see if that brings up intensity or not. No. Okay. What does come up? Anything? I'm just recognizing her. I'm recognizing her um, conditioning through this. I'm understanding why she would say these things to me. Okay. All right. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Now, as far as I can tell, we did something really significant, good steps towards all this judgment that seemingly contributes to the cracking in your voice and, and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a better say it contributes to your lack of freedom in singing. I might want, want to put it that way. Is that a better way to put it? It's a beautiful way to put it, yes. Okay. All right. Um, but I never want to be fooled um, by a temporary result. Okay. Now, chances are we did something significant, but we, what we want to do, what you need to do, I'm suggesting, is tomorrow morning when you wake up, run that movie again. All right. Yes. Yes. And see if you get any intensity. If you're still zero, fine. Okay. But if you're not zero, if you're a three or a six or whatever it happens to be, be aware. And this is advanced lessons number three and four in your course. Be aware of what it is that brings the intensity. And chances are it's not what we worked on. Okay. Okay. Maybe somebody else said something or you remember something else she said that we weren't talking about. Okay. Um, maybe you had a different emotion about it. You were feeling humiliated rather, rather than sad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm making this up. Okay. okay. Because if something else does come up, it doesn't mean this didn't work. Very important. Yeah. It means there's more to do and these other things are showing up. That distinction, Shraddha, as far as a student is concerned, once you get the distinction about how these other aspects come up, then you're able to be thorough with it. And now you are way beyond 95% of all the EFTers in the world. 